Hello and welcome to this Google Hangout from Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Society. My name is Heather Thorstensen and I am the Manager of Communications here at Sigma Xi. Today my guest is Dr. Paul Sandberg of the University of South Florida in Tampa. Dr. Sandberg will receive Sigma Xi's John P. McGovern Science and Society Award in November at Sigma Xi's annual meeting and student research conference in Atlanta. The award recognizes his contribution to not only science, but the impact that science has on society. Dr. Sandberg is the Senior Vice President for Research, Innovation, and Economic Development at the University of South Florida. He is also a distinguished professor, and he is the Executive Director of the University's Center of Excellence for Aging and Brain Repair. Welcome to the Hangout, Dr. Sandberg. Thank you, Heather. It's an honor to be here. So let's start by talking about the Center of Excellence for Aging and Brain Repair, of which you're the Executive Director. What are the primary goals of the center? Well, the center is really a research center. It is part of the uh, medical school. It's within a clinical department, which is neurosurgery and brain repair department. Sure. We're focused on finding therapies for debilitating brain diseases. And the faculty in there, the students, the staff, are all geared towards understanding Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, stroke, traumatic brain injury, uh, mental illness, a number of areas that affect uh, the brain and uh, in our lives. Okay, and the center is focused on getting medical advances to the patients and you have personal experience of dealing with the frustration of waiting for medical advances to be available to help somebody that you loved yourself. Could you talk about that? Well, thanks for asking that question. I think it's, it, it's important for me and I know that uh, what I find out in this world is that when I talk to many people is they all have a personal experience. Everybody has a personal experience at some point about uh, the need for understanding uh, medical advances, uh, appropriate treatments for loved ones. And I was studying you know, Parkinson's, uh, Huntington's disease for many years uh, and had a tragedy in my life with my father having a stroke. And that led me down a new road into understanding uh, more about stroke and how to treat it. Up to that point, which was about uh, 20 years ago, uh, we weren't treating stroke any different than we've been treating it for many years. And we still don't have a lot of great treatments for it unless it occurs, we get, uh, get to it very early. So we have been dedicating uh, much of our lab and much of my own work into trying to find uh, understandings for how stroke occurs, why it occurs, what happens to the brain, and how can we fix it. Okay. And your early research led to some new understandings in why brain cells die in neurological disorders and in drug abuse research. What did you find? Well, early on what we found was that there are mechanisms in the brain that actually can, uh, when they're overused, can kill neurons. They can kill brain cells. And so that's become a big part of a lot of our work in many brain diseases now. We call these, uh, this effect excitotoxicity. In other words, there are certain neurotransmitters, chemicals, which transmit information to nerve cells. And, and when these are overabundance or they're too much, they can excite the nerve almost to death. And so we know this process occurs in a number of diseases and so a lot of drug therapy, in fact, for many years now has been trying to slip, to understand that process, reduce that, that process of, co of causing death to cells. We know many other uh, mechanisms now why cells die in the brain. And so when we understand the basic science, that's when we can come around and try to find really good treatments to, to correct these. Okay, and then moving on to your more recent research, that has been on discovering ways to repair a damaged brain, and you helped lead the team that demonstrated that some cells from bone marrow and umbilical cord blood can be made into neural cells to help repair the brain. How does that repair process work? Well, one of the approaches that, that we've explored, uh, clearly we've explored drug approaches to try to understand various molecules that might work, but another area that we've explored uh, is one that that involves putting in new cells. And for many years, we were looking at ways to put in new cells in the brain to try to regrow the brain or to recover damage. 
And so we, we worked with a number of different cells, including animal cells. Uh, and eventually we, we started looking at cells that were derived um, from umbilical cord blood uh, cells uh, and bone marrow cells. Actually, both those, those cells groups, I would call them a group because they contain many different types of cells. Um, both of those contain uh, early progenitor cells or what we call stem cells. And that these are used to, to travel around the body at sites of injury and produce um, repair. And so it's almost like an endogenous repair mechanism. Umbilical cord blood cells, when a baby's born, you end up with a lot of umbilical cord blood that you can store, for example, and you might be able to use it in the future for certain diseases, as if you're doing a bone marrow transplant for someone with, with a cancer or something where they're getting rid of their whole bone marrow system. And so people store uh, umbilical cord blood for babies sometimes in hopes that that will be available in case a baby gets a certain cancer or an anemia that might need a bone marrow transplant, but you're using this instead. But what we found is that those two cell air areas, the bone marrow and the umbilical cord blood, we found very early on that you can in fact use various techniques, uh, various chemicals to induce some of those cells to become neural cells. So actually you can make them into brain cells uh, that become neurons or brain cells that become glial cells, the supporting cells of the brain. And so what was interesting then is that we thought, okay, if that happens, then maybe we can use those cells, transplant those cells into the brains of damaged animals, for example, that we create an animal model of a disease, and see if we can restore function in those brains by providing these new cells. So over the years now, what we found, in fact, is that, that it is working. It's working to the point where we're now into clinic. Many sites in, this, in the world, in fact, are now putting these types of cells into the clinic, trying to treat patients and looking at various clinical studies to see whether it really works or not. Uh, and that's so important because this is a long process. For any students that are listening to this that want to get into this, you know, this work we looked at early on was almost 20 years ago. And we're now starting to really understand some clinical trials with these. So it's a long process and one that can really be fruitful. But when you start talking about biological things, it's not like an engineering, a, a, you know, a, a piece of metal to make a part. Uh, it can take many years. So we're pretty excited about the fact that we think that various cell types uh, from either the bone marrow or the umbilical cord blood could be used to treat uh, patients with uh, various diseases of the nervous system and other diseases of the body. When you start talking about stem cell research, that becomes a controversial issue for some people. What do you think it's important for people to think about when they are hearing and learning about stem cell research? Well, again, um, stem cell research is still in its infancy. Stem cell research has really been around for, for a while, but, but you know, maybe 30 odd years or more. And as I mentioned earlier, bone marrow transplants are really considered stem cell transplants. So when we give someone bone marrow, because that's where our own body stem cells as adults or, or young individuals uh, reside, that in fact, that when we do those transplants, it's almost like giving a stem cell transplant. The controversy exists in the fact that when a embryo is formed, okay, that the embryo starts out with a number of cells that we call stem cells. And it, what makes a stem cell is a stem cell is a cell that can, be, that can replicate itself, but then it can replicate, become some other type of cell. So in other words, it's not a muscle cell becoming a muscle cell, it's a stem cell becoming another stem cell and becoming a muscle cell, for example, okay? So these stem cells are very useful for understanding the biology of development and for understanding potential therapies. When you use a stem cell from an embryo, it is possible that you could destroy the embryo, okay? So therefore, that's the controversy is related to the ethics of, you know, of using stem cells from that source. As we're understanding this over the last decades, what we're finding is that stem cells are in our bodies already. 
that stem cells can be found in other sources, uh, that you may not have to destroy an embryo to get certain stem cells, and that, uh, that it really is a fundamental biology system within our bodies. And so it may be, in fact, one of the theories of aging. In fact, that our stem cell system in our bodies uh, is no longer working as well as we age, and so therefore it's not, uh, it's not keep, it's helping us to remain young. So, so stem cells is, can be a controversial, but when you work in areas that like umbilical cord blood, as I mentioned, or bone marrow derived cells, or stem cells from other parts of the bodies, um, that's not controversial. And so it's important to keep all research alive at least and going because then we understand the basic biology and we will find uh, treatments that are non-controversial. Could you talk about the benefits that this stem cell research could have, say for somebody living with a damaged brain um, when they are getting stem cells, could it help? How much could it help with their stroke or traumatic brain injury or a degenerative disease? Well, the potential is there for a cure. There's no doubt about it. Whether it'll occur in my lifetime or your lifetime, I don't know. But the potential is there for a cure because we will understand the development of the brain. Uh, we'll understand the cells that are used. We'll understand the types of cells we can put back in. Uh, that's so important. So the potential is there. The animal data shows that, in fact, it can produce significant recovery. And the human data, as it's being tested now, uh, hopefully will show that. But again, human clinical trials uh, need to go on to make sure that we can actually prove uh, that these therapies work. Um, but these are diseases that have no other real therapies right now. The drug studies, we don't really have any drugs for stroke, for chronic stroke, for example. Uh, we don't have uh, you know, good therapies for, for Parkinson's aside from helping with the symptoms you know, by giving certain drugs. Um, there's so many therapies that we want to develop and so many diseases that uh, this is such an important, important research area. And, uh, and so I'm very positive about it. And that's very exciting to hear you say that this is the potential for the cure because so many people are hoping for that. Do we have a sense in the medical community of how far away we are from knowing if that's what this is going to be? That's a really good question. Um, I think when I was younger, I would have answered that and said, oh, in five years or in 10 years, you know, I've said, well, you know, <laughs> those years have passed and, uh, and we're still doing research on it. It takes a long time to do this research. It takes money. It takes uh, investment. It takes companies to be involved and to be partners in these studies because academics, we only do a certain amount of the research. We get it to the point where we think it's really interesting and potential but we're not the ones that are gonna go out there and develop this very much. I mean, there's a lot of faculty that may wanna start companies right now with their, their ideas and do things, and a lot of students out there wanting to do that, but you really need, in many ways, the big companies out there to say, this is really promising, this is something that's gonna really help, and we can make some money at it to, to be able to pay for the, the development of these. And you need the governments to come on board and say, this is really important technology, just like Silicon Valley was important based technology for us to do uh, microcircuits and all sorts of things, that this type of biology of stem cells or of similar type of cell therapies is so important that we want to fund it and create a technology uh, that the United States is in the lead of and that can uh, help across the world. Okay, so hard to pin down a timeline because it does depend on so many factors of the funding and the partnerships and support. Correct. Okay. Well, let me answer that a little longer. So it is hard to pin it down. I would love to say that we will have something tomorrow. Uh, and I'm sure there's people out there that think we'll have something very soon. Uh, I think we need to follow the process. We need to get people excited about doing this research. Uh, and, uh, and I think something will develop with time. And are you seeing the support there for the funding and the partnerships? Are those there for you and you, in, in how you want them to be? I think that the funding uh, is, is adequate for moving some things forward. I think that it's all part of governmental funding. Certain states have really funded this significantly, such as the state of California, you know, put significant dollars into stem cell research. Um, and I think across the world, actually, because of many people feel that this is a fundamental technology and a fundamental biology that we need to understand, that many countries around the world have put in enormous amounts of money 
uh, to take to develop the technologies, get patents for these technologies, and develop products that could help the world. So I think it there is a lot of potential. I think there could be more done. Clearly, I think that um, that large major drug companies could come on board, you know, faster and get more involved. Uh, but what we're seeing right now in our economies is that in fact that that it's harder to get early technologies developed. Most of the investment by large companies uh, and by venture capitalists are usually in technologies that have been, been developed further or long further lines than we'd normally do at universities. So it's a struggle sometimes for many people. And uh, we just have to go out there and keep plugging away and keep getting our message out there. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of patents, you have more than 100 patents worldwide and are considered a highly cited scientist. So I was wondering what do you think it takes to move ideas out of the research phase and into a phase where the therapy or new technology can actually help the people that, they're tr that it's trying to help? That's a great question because this is a, a fundamental educational question as we really look at developing scientists in the future. And Sigma Xi, I've been a member since I was very young, and, uh, and it's an important organization, and it develops students. And this, the great thing about Sigma Xi is you have the annual conference, which is also about students. And as these students developed, what they need to learn early on is that, in fact, there are, there's research, and there's also the translation of that research that if they really believe in their research and it's not, you know, it, and, and that it translates to society in general and not just stays you know, in a laboratory and becomes extremely basic research, which is great too, uh, but that basic research then becomes a publication, which is exciting. But if they really think that their research can go further and go into translating to help society and benefit the economy uh, and help people with various you know, medical diseases such as this, then they need to learn about the invention process. And they need to learn, in fact, that inventing is just another, another leg in the stool for being a scientist. I was not trained in that. When you talk about my patents, those came later in life. I was already a full professor until I, and I realized that I can't get my research translated and companies interested in funding for it unless I protect it and provide intellectual protection from the technology. Not because, um, I think that's so important, you know, to to protect in many ways from a personal point of view of discovering something. But if you really want to translate it, what this government uh, and many most governments around the world say is that if you create something novel that no one else has done uh, and it has a use, then we will give you. You can apply for a patent, and if it gets issued, then we will give you protections for say 20 years. That, that no competitors can come in and do, do that. And that's so important because if you really want to translate your research, you've got to offer that company that you're going to license this to or develop it with some protection and say, you know, it may take five to 10 years to develop this into a product, but your investment in that product is going to be protected for a period of time so that when you actually put it on the market, you're not going to have all these people coming in and with, with generics and everything right away. And so it's important that that will allow the company to feel secure to invest in the product. So invention is very important uh, to get your ideas and discoveries out there. And I hope that the students listening to this and the fat young faculty take this to heart and, and make this just part of their tool chest. And many universities now, including our university, have very robust programs in, in teaching uh, and encouraging students and faculty uh, to invent, to take their research to that next level. Okay, and it's a good time to mention that you are the president of the National Academy of Inventors. And since you mentioned that you didn't have this training for invention as you were going through your career, what training helped you? Well, I really learned about it when I took a break from academics for a little bit and I went to work with a company because um, I thought this would help get some, some products developed and some therapies, especially in cell therapy, to the marketplace and to help people, which is what I would love to see. And so once I was in the company, 
it was like, oh my God, I got, it was like getting an MBA, you know, on a job. It was like all the stuff I didn't know. Here I was, a, 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 you know, a fairly distinguished scientist with a, had trained a lot of students, and there was a whole world out there that I didn't know about. And so I learned about it, and I realized that this company isn't going to be able to invest in these things unless we license in patented pro, uh, pat, patents for potential products. So I got a quick education, and then when I went back to academics, I took that education with me, and I realized that, in fact, if we want to now take our academic work and our discoveries, and we want to move it further and really help people with it outside there, in, especially in the marketplace, then we need to understand the invention process. So I encourage that at this university, and it worked great at this university. A lot of faculty uh, started to look at their research to, in, to take those to patents to get them licensed by companies. A lot of students have done the same thing. Uh, we have a student incubator where we cater to students who want to start businesses. And uh, we have like 40 student companies almost uh, that are in this. And these are started by students and they need to understand all this stuff about a little bit about business and all different ways to move forward. So I guess as part of that movement that's happening across this country right now, um, I eventually, became president of the National Academy of Inventors, which is an academy of universities, now over 200 of them, research universities, that have said that invention and helping in economic development and moving products to society is important. And moving our discoveries to society is important. And it's not just for the elite universities that tend to do this anyways. And so it is a group of, of, of uh, institutions that honor and help teach and train uh, their inventors at their universities, whether they're students, staff, or faculty. And it also honors the best of the best in this country. And so we have a fellows program, for example, where we have the best of the best academic inventors that become fellows of the organization, like many other organizations. So that is, that's been a big honor for me, and it's allowed me to go around the country uh, and the world and, and talk about the importance of invention and, and, and how it keeps us at the forefront of so many different ideas. That's great. And so you mentioned that the academy is mostly uh, university-based. Some Sigma Xi members are not located at universities. Do you have any invention training related advice for them? Absolutely. So when I say university-based, actually the academy caters to universities. It also has not-for-profit research organizations. Uh, has uh, other uh, medical centers that do research as well as government agencies. What it does not have at this point are for profits, but uh, uh, involvement. I mean, we have involvement with them, but we don't have them as members per se. That may change with time, but uh, so those faculty and students who are not necessarily at universities, if they're at a not for profit research institute or others, uh, many of those uh, want to be affiliated with the National Academy of Inventors. Uh, most most research institutes now are trying to push to get their research out there to help. We saw a big push of this from 2009, 2010 because of the, the drop in the economy and the recession that we had, that government grants are going down. And so what we're finding at all our universities, as a vice president of a university, what we're finding is our relations with corporations and private institutions is increasing the dollars. So that's what's keeping us going in many ways when our government funding is going down. So in order to work with companies, in order to work with the corporate sector, we need to understand the language and we need to show them that our discoveries are important and that will help them uh, in the future. So if they don't have, uh, if they're at a for-profit company and they're not part of the National Academy of Inventors, Actually, many for-profit companies have their own inventor programs if they're doing research. Uh, I visited IBM, and they, they, they acknowledge many of their distinguished inventors. Uh, drug companies do the same thing. So if they are interested in this, uh, I think they can find out. And you know what? They can always go and contact me, and I'd be happy to talk to them about it. 
Great. Okay. Well, another piece of service that you do is to serve on the committee that evaluates nominations for the United States National Medal of Technology and Innovation. And that's the highest award given by the U.S. government for technological achievement bestowed by the president. What is it like to serve on that committee? Um, you know, there's a, an old Saturday Night Live routine. I think the guy goes, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You know, I mean, that's how, when I get on that committee, that's how I feel. There's some great, great people on that committee. And there's some great, amazing applicants and nominations for the National Medal. These are our laureates. So, you know, Sweden has a Nobel laureates, but the National Medal of Science, the National Medal of Technology Innovation, those are our laureates from the United States. And so we see the best of the best in there. And uh, the nice thing about being on the Technology Innovation Medal one is that these are people that have translated their research. They have worked in companies, and the companies have done amazing things, created amazing products, or they're individuals that have really discovered something, and it's, and it's created uh, a new, new products that have, that have had fundamental uh, effects in, in this world. And so, for me to look through these resumes and, and CVs of these people and try to decide who is worthy of this, it's so difficult because everybody seems to be worthy. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, but I met some great people through this. Um, it's, it's amazing how, um, how these people have, are so much into helping humanity. It's not about, what I've noticed is it's not about that they did this in order to make, you know, so much money for themselves and, and do, you know, and, and have that kind of lifestyle. It's about creating things to help humanity. And that, to me, is so powerful in the message. So it's been an honor to be on it. I'm still on it for a while. And, uh, and of course, I would love to see uh, as many you know, great scientists and inventors uh, get this medal. So I hope people nominate across this nation uh, great people for it. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for your insight into that. And congratulations again on your McGovern Award. Oh, well, thank you so much, Heather. It's been an honor to talk to you. Thank you. And for anybody who would like to see Dr. Sandberg, he will be speaking at Sigma Xi's annual meeting and student research conference. And that meeting is taking place November 10th through 13th in Atlanta, Georgia. You can find more information about that meeting on Sigma Xi's website, www.sigmaxi.org. Thank you.